<clears throat> well, thank you very much, Josh, and thank you, everybody, for being here. Really appreciate it. Glad we're here to talk about one of my favorite subjects, politics. Politics, politics, politics. It's one of the easiest ways to lose a friend, isn't it? One of the easiest ways to lose a girlfriend, a family member, to, you know, maybe even get fired from your job. But let's hope that doesn't happen tonight, because most of us should be in agreement on a lot of things, I think. Believing in liberty, freedom, hopefully that's why you're here. And if not, well, I hope you have fun anyway. But, you know, with politics, too, I think a lot of it has to do, a lot of the negativity around it has to do with the fact that most of our political discourse in this country has to do with national politics, right? You know, when you talk about politics, you, maybe you bring up something with a coworker, even if they share kind of your similar philosophy, they first want to start talking about Biden or the border or the Durham report or Trump or Ukraine or Russia, all these things that, you know, we really have almost no power over as individuals. I really believe that's one of the reasons politics is so discouraging and disempowering is because so much of the politics we focus on is something we can't do anything about. And how discouraging is it to know problems, to hear <laughs> a lot of bad news? And you can't do anything about it. I mean, that's frustrating. And I think that's what turns a lot of people off from politics. Um, you know, so tonight my, idea, my goal, one of my goals is really to kind of reverse that, is to hope, I hope you leave feeling more empowered and encouraged than when you came in. Because unlike national politics, here at the local level and at the state level especially, one individual and a small group of individuals can have a really big impact. And that's part of what I want to prove to you tonight and show you. And to have an impact, we really have to be knowledgeable about what's been going on and what's been happening in our state legislature. So this is my third year doing a legislative kind of roundup, if you will, a legislative review about what's been going on. So I hope you learn something and I hope you leave feeling a little more empowered. So let's get started. So of course the obligatory you know, kind of introduction of who am I, just real quick. I started getting involved in politics back in 2014. There was the 2013 gun bans, you know, really bad stuff. Some of the worst gun control we've ever seen in our state. That's where we got universal background checks. You know, we're banning private gun sales, basically the magazine ban, some of these laws that are still with us now. So I started volunteering for Rocky Mountain Gun Owners, a group you may be familiar with, and I'll talk a little bit about them tonight. They hired me on for their national, uh, national organization, National Association for Gun Rights. Kind of got hooked up with some of the local politicians, worked on a U.S. Senate campaign, governor campaign, other local races. I learned probably the most being a legislative aide at the state capitol. Now, it's been several years. Fortunately, I still know a lot of the people who were down there at the time, and I'll read you some quotes from them tonight. Reached out to them to get some comments about what happened this year. But it's really interesting to actually see what goes on down there. Most people have no idea. And then during COVID, like so many people, I was pretty discouraged, pretty frightened about what was happening to our state and to our country, right? So I started a website, freestatecolorado.com, with the idea of having a voice, of trying to build a liberty community, trying to create a culture where, you know, individuals can be a little bit more empowered and push back against this authoritarianism we've been seeing. So state legislature here in Colorado meets every year, unfortunately, 120-day session. So this year is from January 9th to May 8th. So just recently, the legislature got out. So your wallets are safe for a little bit at least, and your guns as well. So 617 bills were introduced this year, and we're going to talk about all of them. No, I'm just kidding. It'll be about three-hour talks now, probably longer than that. We'll just hit some of the highlights, of course, some of the general themes about what's been happening. So the makeup of the state legislature, if you don't know, it's basically based the same as our Congress, as our national government, state senate, state house, governor, et cetera. So the way it sits right now, Democrats have the biggest majority they've probably ever had. And it's been interesting to see what effect that's had. So as of May 2023, in the state senate, there's 35 state senators, 23 Democrats, 12 Republicans, almost a supermajority. In the state house, Democrats do have a supermajority with 46 seats to Republicans' 19 seats. So, in a way, Democrats can pretty much do anything they want, but that really hasn't happened. There's been a lot of division and a lot of dissent within the Democratic caucus, which is one of the themes I want to talk about tonight. So, of course, the legislature is made up of politicians who were elected in the recent election for the most part. So, in 2022, it was a very interesting year for Colorado. We actually had stu two state legislators that are members of the Democratic Socialists of America. Has anybody heard about the Democratic Socialists of America? 
the, on their website, they brag that they're the largest socialist organization since the Communist Party disbanded. I mean, that's their bragging. They're, they have book reviews on Karl Marx, zines about tactics for protesting. I mean, it's a pretty radical organization. Uh, shouldn't be too surprising, I guess. You know, some people are probably like, we only have two socialists who are elected, but these are actually like card-carrying members of a socialist organization that is totally anti-property. I mean, it's pretty wild. So some of those had a big role this year in the legislative session. Elizabeth Epps, Javier Marbury, and Lorena Garcia. So Lorena Garcia was appointed. Um, I believe it was uh, Representative Ben Benitez retired like right the day before the legislative session started, and Garcia was put in. So pretty interesting. The Denver DSA Twitter is followed by <laughs> almost all of the Democratic legislators in our government, and they frequently retweet um, the activities and tweets of those three legislators. So pretty interesting to give you an idea of what's been going on here in our state capitol. So as you can see from the town hall they host, bragging that they have, you know, Elizabeth Epps and Javier Marbury elected doing town halls, you know, kind of promoting what they're talking about in the state capitol to their members. Two of the biggest issues were rent control. Marbury is uh, an attorney who's basically an eviction attorney trying to protect renters against rent, you know, the landlords and property owners. And Elizabeth Epps has been one of the primary sponsors of some of the gun bans we saw this year. So there's the Denver DSA Twitter right there that Elizabeth Epps retweeted. Only missing one of our three socialists in the state house. Lorena for Senate, Javier Marbury, and Elizabeth Epps. So they're pretty excited and bragging about it. So just to give you an idea of how extreme things have gotten in Colorado, I do think a lot of Colorado voters, a lot of people would be surprised how far left the Democrats have gone. But some of the Democrats are also surprised and not necessarily happy with how far left some of these legislators are. So 2023, for sure, was one of the most extreme legislatures we've ever seen here in Colorado. Of course, the anti-gun legislation, making it more difficult for Coloradans to defend themselves. The state takeover of local zoning and housing rules, basically turning the small communities into high-density cities like Denver, right? Who needs open space? Who needs local control over zoning? Let the state government decide, you know, let them create districts based on high-density transit lines and they can decide who lives where and totally micromanage all of Colorado's small communities. Anti-gas fuels and environmental schemes to push Colorado back into the dark ages. I'm gonna highlight some criminal justice failures and increased penalties in Coloradans. Uh, oh, another interesting fact, there was uh, so many bills being heard in the legislature this year and it was so mismanaged by the Democratic leadership that for the first time in 84 years, the legislature, both the House and Senate, worked on a Sunday. It's never happened in our lifetime. And very interesting, too, the Republican walkout on the last day, protesting no debate or public input on Senate Bill 303. So we'll get into that a little bit as we continue. So I want to read, uh, a friend of mine is uh, Dave Williams, former state representative. I messaged him and asked him, what do people need to know? <laughs> what should people know about what happened this legislative session? Dave Williams served in the state legislature for I think six years if I'm not mistaken. He's now that just was elected recently the head of the Republican Party of Colorado, the chairman. So here's what he has to say. I said, what do people need to know? That is, so here, here's Dave Williams. That establishment Republicans are largely responsible for getting, into, getting us into the mess we find ourselves in. Sure, the Democrats are radical, and they will push the envelope given their supermajorities, but why were Republicans asleep at the switch? Why didn't they do more to prevent this takeover as outlined in the blueprint? The answer is twofold. First, they are incompetent and feckless. So the chairman of the Republican Party doesn't want anything back. Second, the dirty little secret is they have more in common with the Democrats because they don't mind the growth of government so long as they have a seat at the table or they manage, if they're fortunate enough, to have a majority. If we are to dig our way out of this hole we find ourselves in, then we need to demonstrate a bold and unapologetic contrast, go on offense against the Democrats, and actually advance freedom and limited government principles, regardless if, if we are in the majority or minority. We won't be given the privilege of governing if we can give people something to vote for and believe in again. We had many Republicans in the House and Senate continue the same failed strategies that led us to a super minority. We need those so-called leaders to do a 180 and start to fight effectively. The only method to victory is through the confrontational model of politics. 
So pretty interesting. Bold words from the Republican Party chairman. Of course, you know, the Republican Party in Colorado has been in total disarray over the last several years, as we've seen with Democrats gaining these super majorities. But what's interesting is the Democrats are kind of starting to experience the same thing. So it was a divisive year for Democrats here in 2023. Massive splits between the establishment and progressive legislators. We've actually saw some of the progressive legislators filibuster some Democratic establishment bills. We've had a lot of, seen a lot of infighting, press conferences where they're blowing up at each other, some mean tweeting. <laughs> so pretty interesting. So there were some progressive bills that failed. As we saw, you know, some of these Democratic socialist candidates or legislators have had a pretty extreme agenda. There was one that Emily Sirota, a representative here from Denver, promoted, which was the Fair Workweek Employment Standards. Basically, anybody here, an employer or a manager in charge of scheduling, employees, or have you ever been in that situation? So this bill would have required you to provide a two-week schedule in advance to all of your employees. If you change that schedule, you'd owe them money. You'd have pay based on, you know, changing their schedules. If you give priority to somebody who was newly hired as opposed to somebody who wasn't, it's kind of almost a de facto unionization of all the uh, employees in the state of Colorado. I'll get into that one a little bit more. Another one that failed was to reduce justice involvement for young children, House Bill 1249. Pretty interesting. So the politicians were basically trying to prevent anybody under the age of 12 from being prosecuted by law enforcement for any crime whatsoever. There was a lot of outcry the, from law enforcement, of course, because, you know, some 12-year-olds, 11-year-olds can do some pretty bad things. And the Democratic establishment killed the bill. Another big one was the land use, Senate Bill 213, which would have given the state government total power over local zoning authority. So I'll get into that one a little bit as well. But these bills failed. These progressive bills failed and were killed by Democratic establishment politicians. Another theme that came up this year, an interesting article that KUNC put out, was that Democrats were using a secret ballot system. So what they would do... <laughs> It's pretty interesting. Democrats who can, I'll read this um, from the article. Democrats who control the state legislature are increasingly using a survey to fill out in secret to help determine whether bills live or die. The results are kept from the public, raising questions about transparency and potential violations of the state's sunshine law. Each April, lawmakers click on a personalized link to an anonymous survey. They then use digital tokens to vote for the bills they think should get a piece of the budget each year. They have four days to cast their votes for their top priorities and party leaders end up with a bar chart showing how popular bills are. But the off the book voting system has become part of the fabric of decision making and some lawmakers and government transparency advocates are sounding the alarm. So pretty interesting, kind of flies in the face of representative government or this idea that these legislators are getting together, debating these bills and having the, you know, a spirited discussion with background and expert testimony. Instead, it's anonymous voting on an app. Kind of interesting to see that. Another big theme this year, something that happened, especially towards the end of the legislature. So as we saw earlier, 120 day session, right? So there's only 120 days in which these bills can be passed. So introduced, passed, and signed into law, basically. So because of that, time is on the side of the minority. So the, so the Republicans know this, right? So a lot of it is filibustering, having the bill read at length. So you think you have the budget, a 600 page long bill, have them read it at length. I mean, that's gonna eat up a whole day potentially, right? So that's one of the tactics, delaying tactics that Republicans were using. Also offering endless amendments to slow down debate. So here's from CPR. They say that Colorado has something called Rule 14, which only takes a simple majority to pass and can limit debate on a bill to as little as an hour. Now Rule 14 has been in the legislature rules for a long time, but it's very rarely used because it's kind of anti-democratic in a way. It's, it's against the whole nature of this government where you can have minority politicians and legislators bring up debate and talk and have conversations about the bills that are being heard. But because time was running out, the Democratic majority didn't like that. They wanted to shut down debate, so they invoked Rule 14 on numerous occasions to move along the calendar. So let's get into some of the bills. One of the hottest bills of the year, of course, was the anti-gun stuff. Was anybody follow any of the anti-gun legislation this year, right? If you believe in liberty and freedom, the principle of self-defense, your ability to defend yourself and your family and your business, of course, are some of the most important things out there. So some of the bills that were signed by Jared Polis, our authoritarian governor, Senate Bill 168, giving residents the ability to sue anyone affiliated with the firearms industry. Senate Bill 169, increasing the minimum age to purchase firearms to 21. 
Senate Bill 170, expanding the already existing red flag laws, and House Bill 1219, adding a minimum three-day waiting period to all firearm purchases. So I don't know if anybody's ever heard, but Jared Polis is supposedly a libertarian. He's celebrated by the Washington, D.C., you know, the Cato or Reason Magazine crowd as being somebody who wants to leave you alone. That was the headline. Jared Polis wants to leave you alone. He wants to let you be free. He might be America's most libertarian governor, they said at the time. And then he signs these bills into law, so come on. Now, two of the bills that failed to pass, very fascinating, right? You would think with the Democratic supermajority, with this anti-gun agenda out there, kind of being pushed all across the country. I mean, this, these same bills are be, just got sent into law in Washington. They're being pushed in states. There's this coordinated, nationwide, well-funded effort to disarm Americans at the state level. But they failed. They failed at least on one of the most important bills of the year, which was House Bill 1230, the assault weapons ban. I mean, that should be encouraging. That should really be an uplifting piece of information. You know, Jared Polis, as terrible as he is, said he wasn't going to support this bill. I mean, he was going to veto it, whether it's he had presidential ambitions and doesn't want to be seen as this anti-gun radical, although he signs the other bills. And then, you know, some of these state legislators, you know, I kind of want to get into the fact a little bit later about how there's n they don't have an iron grip these Democrats over Colorado entirely. A lot of them are in swing districts. They don't want to lose their next election because they voted for this or supported it. So you actually had Democrats come out against this assault weapons ban. So in my mind, that's a great thing because the culture, this culture of gun ownership is kind of pushing politics to a point where they can't necessarily get away with an assault weapons ban in Colorado, at least on some level. Another bill that failed to pass, this one was up until the very end, House Bill 1165 would have allowed county commissioners to restrict shooting on rural private property. So right now in Colorado statute, you can have a shooting range on rural property that you own. This bill would have allowed county commissioners, as I said, to restrict that and to prevent that from happening. So thankfully that bill did fail. Another bill that passed but was not signed was the 279, the ban on so-called ghost guns. So unserialized firearms, hobbyist firearms. This bill unfortunately was passed by our Legislators in the state capitol. Jared Polis hasn't signed it yet. Now, even if he doesn't sign it, 30 days from when it's sent to the governor's office, if he doesn't veto it, it'll automatically become law. So he doesn't necessarily have to sign it into law. Sometimes governors do this because they don't want to put their name on a piece of paper showing they support this bill. They might really support it, but they don't want to be very boldly supporting it, if that makes sense. So I'll keep an eye out on that one. More than likely, it's going to pass. Now, the good thing about these anti-gun bills is there's already been massive pushback and lawsuits against them. But this assault weapons ban was pretty interesting. I was there till 1.15 in the morning when this bill was being presented and heard in the state legislature. It was wild. It would probably set a record for over 500 people signing up to testify. I mean, it was incredible. People from all across the state were doing remote testimony. There were, I mean, dozens if not hundreds of people in the state capitol itself there to testify against this bill. I mean, it was like five to one against. It was absolutely incredible. So you can see some of the pictures. That's kind of when I got there on the left, probably about seven o'clock at night. I missed Liberty on the Rocks that night, I apologize. What was really kind of creepy <laughs> is these Moms Demand Action Group, and we're in their red shirts. At the very end, they have this coordinated thing they do. So right as the vote was happening, I mean, they're hanging out, sitting there. At the very, very end, when the vote was gonna happen, they all stood up together in the back and we're hugging each other and holding on to each other. But it was, it was kind of weird. It was almost like intimidating, right? The legislators can see them clearly. Here's a big group of them standing in the back together, almost like, like a cult or something. It was super creepy, but really just showing that they're there, right? They want to show that they're watching. It's very interesting to see. And this photo on the right is basically the very end, you know, probably close to one in the morning or something, the few remaining people who lasted. But pretty amazing to see so much public outcry, so much public input on this terrible bill. So I mentioned Rocky Mountain gun owners earlier. So immediately, pretty much after they passed, within a day or so, they did sue over three of the bills. The three-day minimum waiting period, the 18 to 20-year-old gun ban, um, well, at least two of the bills on this. But So the unconstitutional minimum waiting period, and of course, the 18 to 20 year old um, requirement there. So that was pretty cool to see that they launched these lawsuits immediately. There's, since the Bruin decision, it's a pretty good sign that these, bill, these laws will be struck down in court. Costing taxpayers, of course, millions of dollars in legal fees from, you know, lawyers and our attorney general grandstanding on national television, I'm sure, fighting for these anti-gun laws. 
So talking a little bit about um, some of the Democratic majority's agenda and issues. I don't want to necessarily get into social issues. Everybody's got their own opinions here. I don't know that there's a complete liberty mindset one way or the other, but it is interesting and it's something that needs to be talked about. So abortion, of course, has been in the news a lot over the last year, especially with the repeal of Roe versus Wade. So, of course, Colorado wants to become a safe haven for people to come here and have abortions from in all these states that are enacting these bans on abortion. And then a lot of other states, of course, are passing bans or limiting on this gender transition type of gender affirming care, they call it, for children. So Colorado's becoming a sanctuary state, basically, for these people to come to Colorado get these treatments done, and then they can go back to, to where they came from, potentially. So pretty interesting. I'm going to read this line from foxnews.com about it. One of the bills would prevent the state from recognizing any prosecutions or lawsuits related to anyone who receives or assists in abortions or so-called gender-affirming care. Another would require insurance companies to cover abortions in full, with the exception for those who object on religious grounds. The third bill blocks what pro-abortion activists and Democrats view as deceptive practices by crisis pregnancy centers, which encourage mothers to choose options other than abortion. Critics of pregnancy centers claim that the facilities misrepresent themselves as offering abortions, but then do not provide them. So pretty interesting to see that this is one of the top priorities in our state legislature, especially with everything else going on, this skyrocketing inflation, crime out of control, regardless of what you think about this, it's very interesting that this is one of the priorities of the state government, state legislature, compared to all the other issues that we're facing as a state. So one of the biggest uh, bills this year that drew a lot of protests and outcry from parental rights groups was House Bill 1003. It would create something called, well, it did pass, but creates a school mental health assessment. So imagine your, your child, your middle school child, you know, maybe an impressionable age is going to school, is given this survey to, to answer, do your parents have guns in the house? It's an anonymous survey, don't worry about it. You know, are you, do you have any confusion about your gender, these things? So part of the reason why this bill was so upsetting to so many parental rights groups is that it would require, it would require to notify the parents but only if the student consents, if they're over 12. If a student is suffering from a mental health concern and is in need of services and provide information on behavioral health. So, you know, you have a 13-year-old kid, potentially having suicidal thoughts. Kid says, don't tell mom and dad. Okay, we won't, but we know, and we can refer you to some services that maybe will get you hooked on some sort of pharmaceuticals or give you some other options. So that's the second piece of it. So they can refer the students over the age of 12 directly to beha behavioral health services if the student is in need of services. So potentially putting these children into the system, into some sort of mental health system to start them down this path of being labeled as somebody having mental health problems. I'm sure anybody with a liberty mindset could see the potential for abuse and the potential concern in this type of legislation. So it did have a rally. Uh, unfortunately, the bill did pass, but it was great to see parents kind of standing up and speaking out and getting involved in this. Some of the interesting bills related to wildlife um, you might have seen. So Colorado has, does have some wild horses. It's been a big issue in the West recently, more New Mexico, Arizona area, Four Corners region. But they passed a bill to protect and manage the wild horse population in Colorado. A lot of environmentalists or wild horse <laughs> enthusiasts and fans were pretty excited about that. So kind of cool, I don't know. Maybe not the most libertarian mindset, but it's kind of interesting to see that they want to maintain and allow wild horses to, to live and not just be rounded up and euthanized by the federal government. Another big one was Senate Bill 256, management of gray, gray wolves introdu reintroduction. So as you know, last couple years uh, passed so that gray wolves are going to be state <laughs> controlled and managed, introduced back into Colorado. A lot of outcry from rural Colorado about this. A lot of the communities are very concerned because these wolves are still potentially protected under some sort of Endangered Species Act. They come into your ranch, they kill your livestock, not much you can do about it. Maybe you're compensated if the government deems that you're worthy of being compensated, you fall into their program, maybe they give you a little bit of money. Still puts you in a pretty bad position if you're a rancher or a farmer. So there's actually this bipartisan bill passed by most Western Slope and rural legislators. A lot of Democrats actually supported it to slow down this reintroduction of gray wolves, to say, hold on a second, let's kind of reevaluate and, and make sure we're not jumping the gun on this. Well, yesterday, um, Jared Polis vetoed the bill and said, no, this bill was unnecessary. We're going to go ahead and continue our plans to have state-managed gray wolf populations that here in Colorado. 
So I do want to talk about some of the positives, <laughs> potentially positives if they would have passed, but some pro-liberty legislation we would have had. So I guess part of the idea too of me, of what I want to convey to you is that there's some good legislation that could pass if the right legislators are elected, right? I mean, there's some really good bills that were introduced this year, and I want to talk about a few of them. So this bill I actually testified on down at the state capitol back in February. Um, who remembers COVID? Anybody? Remember that thing? <laughs> Remember the governor shutting down our lives, t shutting down our businesses, telling you you weren't essential, saying don't go to school, don't go to work, you stay home, you know, turn Colorado into a prison basically for a year plus or so, you know, I guess depending on how you look at it. So this bill was an, a really good bill, would have, limited, would have limited the governor's ability to continuously rule renew a state disaster emergency. So he would have been able to say, okay, 30 days, sure, let's give him the benefit of the doubt, something happens, some crazy a wildfire, maybe there is a virus out there, well, the governor can do 30 days. Anything past 30 days, he'd have to go to the state legislature, which is the representatives of the people, get their approval to continue those, to continue those emergency declarations on. As it is right now and has been, governor can just keep renewing and renewing and renewing and renewing. So it was a really good bill, of course it failed. Democrats killed it in committee. Kyle Fury was down there with me testifying um, again in support of this bill. So I just want to kind of give you a glimpse of some of the good bills that are out there that could pass. It's not all necessarily bad stuff that these politicians are pushing. There is some push to kind of restore some checks and balances. Another good one from Representative Scott Bottoms, House Bill 1063 to reduce the state income tax. That would have been an awesome one, right? More money in your pocket, taxation is theft, you know, stimulate the economy, let you keep your hard-earned money, retire earlier, work less, spend time with your family more. All great arguments for eliminating the state income tax. Of course, it failed, but it would have lowered the state income tax from 4.4% to 3.5%. So, pretty good bill there. Another pro-liberty legislation was Ken DeGraff. This was a pretty bold piece of legislation. It would have been awesome if it would have passed. House Bill 1044 to ban gun registration in Colorado, prevent gun taxes or fees, so tax stamps basically, prevent any future gun bans by the federal government or state or local authorities, and prevent gun confiscation. So a really bold piece of legislation that would have said the state of Colorado is not going to go along with any federal gun control, and basically all gun control in Colorado will be banned from now on. So that would have been a pretty good bill if it would have passed. A couple other ones um, that did pass I thought were pretty good. House Bill 1279 to allow retail marijuana online sales. So once this bill takes effect, you can actually b pay for your marijuana online. There you go. You know, you don't have to necessarily go in the store. You still have to go pick it up and show an ID, but it's a step in the right direction, I suppose. A little bit of liberty. House Bill 1182, remote public access to criminal court proceedings. This was a pretty good one. I think the Democrats did get on this. To allow remote access for the public to observe any criminal court proceeding conducted in open court. So kind of a great idea, increase transparency, you know. Let the public kind of view and see what's going on in these courtrooms and provide, you know, some semblance of, of you know, public input, I suppose, in some level. Uh, another really cool one that did pass, I didn't write that on there, but House Bill 1261. No requirement for selective service higher education. Anybody who went to college in Colorado, you had to show them a form that you were registered with a selective service, you know, in order to go to a public institution. Of course, that's remnants of the draft that we used to have in this country many, many years ago. Well, this removes that requirement that anybody going to public school or public college, excuse me, would have to register for selective service in order to enroll in that institution. So that bill did pass. So that's kind of cool, you know, if there's often talk of a draft coming back, not that it will, but at least this is one step in the direction to kind of prevent that from happening. Some criminal justice legislation, some pretty interesting stuff here. This bill did make national headlines, House Bill 1135. So they wanted to increase the penalty, or they did increase the penalty for indecent exposure in view of minors. What was really controversial about this bill is 27 Democrats in the state house voted against the bill. Now the deal, bill did pass by both houses or both chambers and is going into law. But it was pretty interesting to see that some of the legislators had a problem with it, right? Who could be against indecent exposure to children at least being a felony, right? So State Representative Leslie Harrod said, quote, these types of laws have been used to ban drag shows, to target individuals who use the restroom of a sex that they identify with, a public restroom, to charge them with felony charges. I'm very concerned about the attacks against the transgender community that are happening across the country. 
I don't know what anybody else thinks about that, but if if <laughs> if you know drag shows are leading to indecent exposure in front of children, maybe there's a line there. I don't know, but most the majority of Democrats, majority of legislators in our state capitol did agree that it should be a felony. So very very interesting to see the controversy over this. Kind of another example of some division within the Democratic caucus. A really good bill that unfortunately was watered down. So Due Process Asset Forfeiture Act. So anybody familiar with uh, asset forfeiture, civil asset forfeiture, right? Pretty bad practice, you know? You get pulled over, you got $20,000 in cash, maybe you just took it out of the bank, maybe you're gonna go buy a house or go do something with it. Well, most of the time law enforcement considers you a criminal, just de facto, because why would you have so much money on you? They might as well just take it, right? So civil asset forfeiture lets them steal your money without you being convicted of a crime or even accused of a crime in most cases. So great bill, um, you might be able to see, it's kind of hard to see, but all these lines are crossed out of what the bill's original intent to, was. Um, so it basically was watered down to only require a report on how civil asset forfeiture is being used in our state. So still a step in the right direction, I think, you know, still kind of a good thing. Let's have some more light shine on civil asset forfeiture and see where we can go with, with ending this practice. But um, interesting to see that there's some headway being made and hopefully civil asset forfeiture can totally be banned in Colorado going forward. Another interesting one, House Bill 1042, admissibility standards for juvenile statements, so prevents law enforcement from lying to minors. So pretty interesting. You like that one, Rodney? So, so of the 268 juveniles, this is from an article here on coloradopolitics.com, of the 268 juveniles exonerated for crimes, 34% had given false confessions, according to a 2022 study by the National Registry of Exonerations. In contrast, only 10% of exonerated adults provided false confessions. The rate of false confessions increased to 54% for these, those aged 14 to 15 years old and 78% for those under 14 years old. I mean, it kind of makes sense, right? You know, you tell somebody who's under 14 years old, hey, we got videotape of you. It's better if you just come clean. Just tell us what we want to hear. You know, you're going to be way better off if you just tell us what we need, what we want to hear. You know, some of these kids, you know, they go along with it, unfortunately. So a good thing, I would say, that, you know, not allowing law enforcement to lie to minors. What do you guys think? Good one. <laughs> All right, House Bill 1202. This was a very controversial bill that came up as well. Overdose Prevention Center Authorization, so safe supervised injection sites. So this bill would not have created them, but it would have allowed local municipalities, local communities to have safe injection sites where somebody can go in there, get a clean needle, be watched over by somebody who has medical experience and do hard drugs. So there's this article by this guy named Kyle Roth who was a heroin addict who was totally against this bill and I thought he had a very interesting thing to say. He said, enabling addicts to continue shooting poison into their veins is the exact opposite of keeping them safe. The safe injection site bill is cruel, not kind sentencing addicts to continue suffering as they lose their willpower, minds, bodies, and finally their lives to the demon drug. And there's no antidote for methamphetamine or cocaine overdose so that the addict could die in the safe site. So pretty interesting bill. You know, there's some libertarian debate, I guess, you know, let people shoot up if they want. But it's interesting to see that this bill failed even in Democrat-controlled legislature. Another criminal justice bill to expand post-conviction DNA testing. So this was pretty cool. I mean, I think this is a good win. Expanding eligibility for people convicted of felonies to receive DNA testing. So this bill expands the population. This is from the bill uh, fiscal note on the state legislature website. The bill expands the population to include persons on felony parole, registered sex offenders, and persons who have completed their felony prison sentences. Individuals who are charged with a felony but received a not guilty verdict by reason of insanity are also eligible for testing. So the courts must now order testing if there is a reasonable probability that the person would not have been convicted if DNA testing produced a favorable result at trial. So, right, I mean, how many people, unfortunately, over the years, over decades, have been imprisoned falsely and a DNA test could have gotten them out? So this is kind of lowering that standard in which DNA testing could be applied. Good one. What do you think? Good one? Yeah, cool. Right on. Interesting, too. Of course, anybody has seen swatting be a big issue here, and not necessarily just in Colorado, but across the country, right? Whether you're your favorite podcaster or some politician, they're getting swatted all the time. People are making fake 911 calls saying there's a mass shooter, SWAT breaks down the door, potentially to cause a violent situation. So this actually did pass to make swatting a felony. 
So pretty interesting. Um, you know, I'm not necessarily in favor of more criminalization of society, but unfortunately this, I, it, will this, I don't know, will this bill prevent swatting from happening? You know, do the people who are doing swatting, they're only doing it because it's a misdemeanor. Now that it's a felony, they're going to stop. I don't know. I don't know that's going to stop anybody from doing it, but it's interesting to see the state government really try and react to these situations that are happening. So by felonizing false shooting reports, the bill also increases resources law enforcement can dedicate to the investigations, Bridges said. This is from a Denver Gazette article particularly when the suspect is out of state, as is believed to be the case for the February 22nd school shooting reports. That was something like a dozen schools in Colorado all got swatted on the same morning by somebody out in the East Coast. In Colorado, class six felonies are punishable by 12 to 18 months in prison and fines of $1,000 to $100,000. Now this was a, a bad one. I was pretty upset about this. I hate red light cameras. I hate speed cameras. But unfortunately, this bill is increasing the amount of speed cameras in Colorado. So speed cameras on steroids creates a surveillance state with more cameras. Senate Bill 200. So it's interesting to see, you know, especially, you know, this whole post-George Floyd era where Democrats came out so strong for criminal justice reform, defunding the police. And they've had a couple good things in my perspective. But then they come out with stuff like this where they're just going to criminalize society more. We're going to have, you know, somebody going late to work, you know, some working class person just barely making it by. Now they get a ticket in the mail because they didn't. They drove a, a few miles too fast, you know. What was interesting, too, a lot of people who are involved in red light cameras and activism against it know that they're, in general, you have to be served, right? You can't just get it through the mail. You don't necessarily have to pay it. Well, this bill changes that. So it removes the requirement that penalty assessment notices or summons be served and allows it to be sent through the mail. So that's a bummer. But <laughs> interesting to see what's been going on. Now, some of the biggest bills of the year have to do with housing, property development. Of course, you know, everybody in Colorado knows there's a housing crisis, right? House prices are out of control. People can't find a place to live. All these Californians moving here, you know, our, our poor Californians don't have enough money to afford these houses. So we got to do something about it, you know? So some of these bills failed, some of them passed, but it was definitely one of the biggest topics in the state legislature, drew some of the biggest comments, some of the biggest pushback from local municipalities. Very interesting to see Boulder, Golden, some of these mountain communities all protesting against many of these bills together against what the state government, really against what Polis is trying to do. We have in the room Nat the great Natalie Menton here, who is one of the big leaders pushing it back against these bills. Did a lot of great videos on freestatecolorado.com about it. But some of the pushback worked, right? I mean, don't you think, Natalie? Some of the pushback worked. I mean, that's part of my message to you is empowering is not only look at some of the bills that failed. You know, so look at some of the bills that passed. There were some good ones that passed. And there were some bad ones that failed. You know, it's not, there's not this monolithic authoritarianism in our state. As, as often as it may seem, bad bills can be stopped. So one of the biggest ones touched on a little bit earlier, Senate Bill 213 was the land use bill. This was Jared Polis's signature bill, big press conference on the western steps of the state capitol, talking about how he's going to save Colorado's Californians moving here and giving them better, cheaper houses to live in, you know? So would have forced high-density housing in communities across Colorado, um, around transit hubs, right? So they'd create these districts. Tell me if I'm wrong, Natalie. Create these districts saying, hey, here's the central line of where the mass transit's going to go. We're going to plop high density housing in that area so we can create this whole new vision of what we want Colorado to be. And local municipalities say, we don't want this, you know? I mean, a lot of people move to the suburbs or move to a small community to have that kind of life, to live that kind of lifestyle. And here comes the state government saying, well, we know better than what you, than you do in your local community. We're going to force this upon you. So this bill actually failed. This massive pushback from municipalities across the state was one of the main reasons this outcry stopped the bill. And it was one of the biggest failures that Jared Polis had this year, one of the biggest items on his agenda that didn't, didn't make it. Well, they would have more of that. They'd have more high-density housing around light rail. I mean, could you imagine? Who wants more people, right? More crime, more, more traffic? Nobody wants more people in the communities. I don't know. I guess some people do. The developers do. But nonetheless, uh, House Bill 1190 unfortunately did pass. This one was uh, basically theft, as Natalie put it, just stealing property from property owners. So imagine you own a, a you know, a, 
a duplex, it has to be bigger than a duplex, but maybe a multifamily property, a small apartment building, maybe it's been your family for generations. Well, this says that local governments now have the ability to purchase that for their state housing schemes. They have the first right of refusal. So you put that on the market, you have to let the state local government know and they get first dibs on buying it. They get to tell you what the fair price is. They get to basically hold up this property you know, for nearly a year potentially to stop you from selling it on the market and getting that money yourself. So I mean, this is basically a Soviet era type of scheme to create you know, state housing across, the, across Colorado. You know? So unfortunately that bill did pass. But one of the things about that, it does rely on local governments to enforce it or to take advantage of this law. So even more reason to run for city council, to get involved in your local community, you know. Uh, House Bill 1115 to repeal the prohibition on local residential rent control. So this is one of the, we looked at Harvey R. Marbury, one of the Democratic Socialist candidates or legislators in the state capitol. This was one of his signature bills he was pushing hard to repeal the state ban on rent control. Well, rent control's failed everywhere. It's been tried, but they're still trying. But it's interesting to see this fail here in Colorado, even in our deep blue progressive state, supposedly. It did pass the House, but failed in the Senate. One of the bills that did pass was 1120, eviction protections for residential tenants. So mandatory mediation for eviction proceedings. So, you know, making it a little bit harder for you to evict a bad tenant, you have to go to this mandatory mediation meeting to see if you can come to some sort of conclusion. I mean, not really fair to property owners. And then House Bill 1255, regulating local housing growth restrictions, unfortunately. So prohibiting local housing growth restrictions. So telling local communities they can't have restrictions on, to what, on extra housing in their communities, unfortunately. So a rough one there. Not necessarily removing zoning, but um, you, know, you might have a prohibition, say in Lakewood, for example, or in Golden, saying we're not gonna allow a certain amount of growth we're gonna restrict growth, and this says you can't necessarily do that. That it's in the state's interest to allow a limited growth in local communities. So moving on a little bit to anti-energy and environmental legislation. Of course, one of the biggest pushes for centralizing political control over our lives is this green agenda, right? We're all gonna die 10 years ago because the earth's getting too hot, there's too much carbon dioxide, you know, who can handle all this rain we're getting? Oh my gosh, you know, start panicking people. So of course, <laughs> the government has a solution. These politicians are gonna save us. They're gonna save us from this poor environment. So as this headline reads here, Colorado lawmakers want to eliminate all carbon emissions by 2050. Now, how is that even gonna be possible? You know, are they gonna eliminate all gas-powered vehicles? Well, I guarantee you, if a lot of them would if they could. They're starting with lawn equipment and basically trying to do everything they can to push lawn equipment from being gas lawn mowers to phasing out leaf blowers and to really push that into subsidizing electric lawn mowers. I mean, it's totally ridiculous. So this Senate bill was one of the, this bill was one of the landmark green bills of the year, Senate Bill 16, greenhouse gas emission reduction measures. So a whole plethora of new powers for the state government. So this Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission can have no authority over injection wells to basically, you know, under Safe Drinking Water Act, have more control over local gas and oil producers requiring local governments to expedite review of land use applications involving renovation, rebuilding, and reconditioning of transmission lines, and, if, and having insurance companies that do business in Colorado with more than $100 million of activity must participate in and complete a national insurer climate risk disclosure survey, and require recovered methane protocols to allow for the use of manure from beef cattle operations, you know, because of course they want to get rid of cows, they want to get rid of beef and people. So pretty interesting, really a bad bill. Um, some of the biggest authoritarian advances we've seen in recent years has to do with this green agenda. A few more of these, the House Bill 1294, a pollution protection measure. So businesses were totally against this. I mean, it was everybody from breweries to hotels, bakeries, warehouses, pretty much anybody who runs a business in Colorado is against this. I can imagine, you know, crypto miners should be against it as well because, you know, if you're using too much energy, if there's too much carbon pollution due to your business operation, then you need to have a little bit more stringent regulation over you. That's basically what this bill pushes. So from this Colorado Politics article, it says, <clears throat> make no mistake, this bill goes far 
beyond just the energy industry. Colorado Chamber President and CEO Lauren Furman said in a statement, adding the proposal House Bill 1294 would create complex and costly new regulations on a broad range of businesses, from breweries to bakeries to hotels to warehouses. So this House bill proposes a host of changes to Colorado's emissions regi regime. Among other provisions, the bill removes the prohibition against the Air Quality Control Commission adopting regulations that are more stringent than applicable federal law to cover indirect sources of emissions. So now local laws can be more stringent than federal law, allowing anyone to bring a civil suit against any en an entity for violating clean air regulations. So get ready to see more litigation. In requiring the Oil and Gas Conservation Commission to investigate any complaint alleging a violation of state law, rule, or order related to oil and gas. So really they're pushing to eliminate the oil and gas industry in Colorado. So fun, cheery stuff, right? You know, I hope everybody's got a smile on their face. Lots of good stuff happening in their state legislature. <laughs> All right, so some of the, what I've been calling the war on the working class, you know, most Coloradans were working people, you know, working our butts off, saving as much money as we can, trying to buy a house, trying to retire, trying just to live our lives, you know, provide the best life we can for ourselves and our families. Well, some of these bills, whether, the, whether these legislators know it or not, are directly attacking that. And I would say House Bill 23, or Senate Bill 11, Minors Drivers ed Education Requirements, was pretty rough. I mean, who here, when you're 16 years old, you get your driver's license, you get this sense of freedom, right? You can leave the house, you can go visit your friends, you can become you know, a member of society, get a job, go do all of this. Well, apparently the state government, some of these state legislators, think it should be a lot harder for an individual to get their driver's license. You should have 36 hours of driver's ed, have to pay for expensive classes and fees. I mean, come on, you know, you have a working class family, they got a couple kids, they gotta now pay all these classes and just to drive so they can go get a job. I mean, a total insult the dignity of, of a 16 year old. Thankfully this bill did fail. One of the sponsors of this bill, fun, funnily enough, there's this like uh, democratic organization called New Era Colorado, which is really trying to help <laughs> democratic electives and s Democrats get elected and push this kind of agenda. They named one of the bill sponsors, one of the champions of the youth agenda in Colorado for her efforts this year. And I was like, how bizarre is that? She sponsored this bill to make it extremely difficult for young people to drive, and she's a champion of youth, the youth agenda. Totally bizarre. What was interesting about this bill from this page two Complete Colorado article shows that AAA is pushing this bill because they have a driver's ed course that matches the requirements of the bill. So Dave Williams said this. They're doing it because they know that through government force, they can create a market that they will have a monopoly over. They can force people to adhere to requirements that their program is already offering. Any other competitors are going to be hosed because they weren't first to market. So the article author continues, if AAA were to capture just one quarter of new license holders, the company stands to gain at least an additional $2 million per year in added revenue off Colorado taxpayers. If no other company is up and ready to go, AAA is looking at added revenue reaching nearly $8 million a year. So a perfect example of how these industry groups, these lobbying groups, get their hands in the pot of taxpayer money, push these bills that are gonna dr directly help them financially. So yeah, pretty, pretty sad stuff, but hey, it failed. So that's good news. Right on. Another one we talked about a little bit earlier is Fair Work Week employment standards. I mean, totally bizarre that you'd have requirements for employers. So you're say you have a small business, you have some employees, you know, you're trying to create a positive impact in your community. This would require you to give two week notice of employee work schedules, which if you have a restaurant, I mean, come on, that's like impossible. I mean, who, you know, who can do this except for the Walmarts of the world, right? The big corporations. You have to also offer predictability pay, rest shortfall pay, retention pay, and minimum weekly pay. So you have to say what you're gonna pay them minimum weekly. And if you don't, you gotta pay them it anyway. I mean, it was absolutely crazy to see that um, some of these legislators think that this is a good idea. So the bill sponsor, Representative Emily Sirota said, quote, if an employer is going to add hours to the employee's schedule, they would be owed an hour of predictability pay. And if they subtract hours from the schedule, they'd be owed two hours of predictability pay at the worker's hourly rate. I mean, doesn't it sound like some sort of Soviet type of scheme or something, you know, where the government's gonna come in and tell you exactly how much you're paying your employees based on, on them dictating when they should be working? I mean, absolutely bizarre. Crazy to see what's been going on. Thankfully, the bill failed, though. I mean, that's a good news. That's something that's a real positive. One of the biggest bills that ended up the legislative session kind of the last week was this Senate Bill 303. Senate Bill 303, I was a little excited about that name, you know, 303, our area code here for a lot of people. So unfortunately, it's a really bad bill. So of course, property taxes, 
since the Gallagher Amendment, if you've been following this, was repealed, property taxes are skyrocketing. If anybody here is a homeowner, you might have gotten a notice in the mail recently about your property tax increase. I mean, for some of these people who are living on a fixed income, who can barely afford to make ends meet as it is, now all of a sudden have a 50% increase in their property taxes every year. I mean, it's absolutely outrageous. Now, the legislators knew this was going to happen. I mean, this has been dozens and dozens of news stories about this. It's not a secret. We saw what the Democrats have made their priorities over the year, right? We saw some of the bills they were pushing and celebrating how great they are, but they waited to the very last week of the legislative session to address these skyrocketing property taxes. I think there's a few reasons. For one, they wanted to limit debate. For one, they wanted to come in and act as heroes and really push through their agenda without anybody saying otherwise that it was a bad idea. But this bill is really bad. There's this great article actually in Vail Daily, believe it or not, an editorial from Mark Lewis. So he explains... It's apparent that this proposal is a wolf in sheep's clothing. Rather than reducing taxes, it merely restricts increases while diverting money from our Tabor refunds to more than cover any, any revenue loss. Moreover, an attached provision effectively establishes a state-administered welfare system funded by Tabor dollars. Talk about deceiving the flock. Allow me to break it down for you. The property tax reduction proposition, so Proposition HH, is potentially going to be on our ballot this year. There's some confusion or some problems with naming it HH, as the legislature did. But this property tax reduction proposition includes a provision to fund any loss of revenue from the general fund. Essentially, it's a shell game. While the proposal claims to lower taxes, the net result is zero savings for taxpayers. Additionally, while it mandates limits on assessment rates that actually won't necessarily curb taxes since municipalities remain free to adjust their levies, there is a limit on tax revenue increases, but with today's inflation, that limit would be higher than the existing 5.5% limit in place today. It's like chasing your tail, going in circles with no progress. So basically, they want to steal our tax refunds that's owed to us through the Taxpayers' Bill of Rights. It's been around for 30 years now. They want to take that money and use it to slightly lower property taxes for some people. And they want to call that a great property tax reduction. And we should all be clapping and celebrating these wonderful legislators and our governor for doing such a thing. So I'd really encourage you to reject Proposition HH if that's what ends up being called on the ballot this November. The second part of this with HH is to also make everybody's Tabor refund identical. So if you remember last year, this is what Governor Polis did, kind of a way to buy votes right before the 2022 election, was to say everybody here in Colorado is going to get a $750 check, regardless of how much taxes you paid, you know? I mean, isn't it fair if you paid more taxes, you should probably get more of that money back in a tax refund or a tax rebate? That's how it should be. Fortunately, they're playing a little bit of game to buy voters, right? You give more, you take money from some, give it to other people. It's the oldest game in the political playbook, right? So don't necessarily need to go into all of this, but the idea is to change it to a, a single fixed value payout, regardless of the taxpayer's actual contribution. So this provision will actually pass automatically if voters approve the property tax proposition. So the reason behind connecting these two provisions is a mystery. It appears like a wolf is trying to sneak into the flock. State Senate Majority Leader Dominic Moreno argues for equal distribution, claiming that a tiered rebate system is not equitable and that the money should go to those with the most need. But let's pause for a moment. Tabor is not a welfare program. It's a tax refund program. When it comes to tax, when it comes to refunds, rebates, the amount you receive is typically based on your investment. If you're a stockholder, the dividend you get depends on the number of shares you own. It's straightforward. If you tax people based on their income and then rebate them a flat amount, it's no longer a taxpayer bill of rights. It's a welfare program in disguise. In this case, an 18-year-old kid who plays video games all day in the basement of his parents' house would get the same rebate as the parent who works 60-hour weeks and pays thousands in taxes. Is that truly equitable? No, it's not. So, I hope you are empowered <laughs> and encouraged after all this terrible bad news. But part of the reason why I am positive and I'm an optimist, you know, look how many bills failed, right? Some of these terrible progressive bills that really would have caused a huge detriment to our economy, to our ways of life, shut down small businesses. They failed. They failed to pass. The assault weapons ban failed to pass. You know, there's not this monolithic authoritarian system as much as there appears to be. There really isn't. There's division. There's a lot of different interest groups and there's a lot of people fighting this fight. And if more people fought, if more people got involved, and people were a little bit better organized on the Liberty community, I really think we can have a massive impact to push back. So one of the things you can do is testify. You know, as I said in the beginning, national politics can be so frustrating and so disempowering because there's nothing you can do about it. You know, even a billionaire has limited access to what's going on in Congress, right? What, what hope do we have? But at the state level, 
any of us can show up and testify. We can speak truth to power. We can look these politicians in the eye no further away than you are from me and tell them they are wrong. Tell them they are authoritarians, they're tyrants, and they're trying to steal our money and have no right to do so. It's an extremely empowering thing to show up there. These politicians aren't used to it. I guarantee you, you get people down there speaking, it freaks them out, and that's a good thing. So check out freestatecolorado.com slash testify. Wrote a really nice guide to make it easy to make your voice heard at the state capitol. Each bill goes in front of at least two committees. So you have at least two opportunities for public input. So make your voice heard. Show up and speak out. You meet great people down there when you do that. Another thing you can do, another great way to be empowered is to help elect pro-liberty candidates. You know, um, in my mind, there's... Uh, yes, by Jessica Fenske here, running for Nevada City Council. Huge step in the right direction. But I would say also at the state level. I mean, there's tw there were 12 Democrats' seats in 2022 that won with less than 3,000 votes. 3,000 votes is nothing. With this massive amount of population increases we've experienced, that's nothing. And don't get me wrong, most of the Republicans are bad. I mean, we heard it from the uh, Republican chairman himself, you know, saying that it's the Republicans' faults because they're so incompetent that the Democrats are getting away with so much. But there are some pro-liberty legislators. We saw some great examples of pro-liberty legislation, and these people need our support. And maybe they can be you. You know, you can run and have a voice. I mean, look at Ron Paul, even Rand Paul, some of these great politicians who've, who have made an impact and grown the liberty movement because of it. So part of that is also defending liberty champions and supporting pro-liberty organizations. Really in 20, so state house every two years there's an election in 2024. There's gonna be another election coming up. There's at least five vulnerable democratic seats that I've identified. You can check it on the website. I mean, they won, I mean one of them won with like 400 votes, 300 votes. I mean, you have a small organization, you could swing those elections with, with not that much money, not that much work. So some of the great organizations you can support, and um, there's people out there fighting, you know? You don't have to be the, start a new organization or a new group. You don't have to be the Lone Ranger out there trying to make an impact. There's other organizations fighting this fight, and they maybe need money, they need support, they need volunteers, you know? The awesome one is Liberty Scorecard Colorado. These people are doing great work. They track almost every single bill that goes through the state legislature, rate it, and then they rate all the different legislators. So they just came out and showed that they just had a press release yesterday, I believe. It was either yesterday or today. Stephanie Luck and Ken DeGraff were their two Liberty leaders. I mean, they had the best voting record. Um, how they measure, it says, the Colorado Liberty Republicans produce the annual Liberty Scorecard. This is a measure of how our state lawmakers vote according to, according to constitutional principles, individual rights, free markets, and limited government. So if you support those things, I mean, this is a great way to track what's going on. Who are the good guys? Who are the bad guys? You know, and let's demonize and really shame the bad guys and support and help the good guys. You know, that's what we need more of. There are good people out there fighting this fight. Another great group is the Colorado Union of Taxpayers. They rank all the bills as well. They have an awesome newsletter, which I have a copy of here from the last one that they put out. But you can be a member for $25 a year. They have 2.7 million readers over the last... 46 years they've been doing this. They rank all the legislators, they rank all the bills, they give out awards of who are the champions protecting our taxpayers, or protecting us as taxpayers and defending the rights of taxpayers. So that's pretty cool. I mean, these people have an influence. Colorado Liberty Scorecard, the scorecard they send out, they send it to each of the legislators. I talked to Sue Moore recently who runs it. She says they track who opens them. You know, you can tell that if you know email marketing, right? She says within minutes, all of the legislators, even the worst, most authoritarian legislators, look to see what's being said about them. You know, they're just people. So calling them out and really trying to have an impact in terms of publicizing what they're doing is huge, is huge. I actually have a handout with all these organizations on it I'll give out. But um, I think a lot of these politicians get away with a lot of what they do because nobody's shining the light on them, right? I mean, they're people. They have businesses in your community. Their kids go to school. People don't know what they're doing, you know? And if these organizations are out there showing what they're doing and shining a light on it, it has a massive impact. Another one is the Tabor Foundation and Tabor Committee. Taxpayers' Bill of Rights is one of the biggest reasons why Colorado is as free as it is. It's prevented all these tax increases. Could you imagine if we didn't have the Taxpayers' Bill of Rights? 
these politicians would have passed massive tax increases on all of us over the last several years. They would have done it every single chance they got. They, they legally cannot. They have to go to the voters' task for a tax increase. Now, they found little ways to work around it by calling things fees instead of taxes, but nonetheless, it has really slowed down the growth of government. So supporting the Tabor Foundation and Tabor Committee is paramount. Another great one is Rocky Mountain Gun Owners, $30 a year to be a member. They are leading the fight for our Second Amendment rights in Colorado. They were down there testifying on all of the um, gun bills, and uh, there's a couple of their staffers right there. Um, not only that, but of course they launched the lawsuits against these gun bills. Um, they're going to launch a lawsuit against this gun, a ghost gun ban as soon as it becomes law. So I mean, they're out there fighting. I wanted to read uh, from one of our Liberty leaders down at the state legislature, Representative Ken DeGraff. This is his first year in the legislature. Really interesting guy, 27 years in the Air Force, total constitutionalist. I mean, he was pushing civil asset for to abolish civil asset forfeiture in Colorado, to preserve the Second Amendment to the point of restricting the government from enforcing gun laws. I mean, this guy, as far as I can tell, is pretty legitimate. So I, I sent him a message. I said, Representative DeGraff, you know, same thing I asked Re uh, Dave Williams. They said, what should I pass on to the audience? What do people need to know? So he wrote a little bit here I'd love to read. This was the year of trying to save Colorado from good intentions because they are too often the source of the worst outcomes. As Karl Marx famously observed, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. And given the history of Marxism, I wonder if that, that was not more of a strategy than merely a casual comment. Democrat legislators genuinely seem to want to solve problems, but it appears they cannot fathom that government intrusion and taxation are too often the source of the problem, leading them to only envision increased government intervention as a solution. Many legislative writs were to paper over the unintended consequences of prior legislation without considering the root cause or downstream effect. This session has reinforced for me that there is no problem the government cannot make worse with the solution. When presented with an option, Democrats consistently chose increased state power with centralized control over individual liberty predicated on personal responsibility. Unfortunately, this is not entirely without basis. As John Adams observed, our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. Having rejected the moral law, materialist legislators seem only able to envision the imposition of compliance according to their utopian vision and the requisite enslaving subordination of the individual. While our Declaration of Independence and Constitution very clearly establish the bounds within which government can act without becoming, a tyrannical, without becoming tyrannical, Democrats seem only able to envision solutions outside of those bounds in pursuit of some ethereal greater good. History consistently warns us, however, that for the greater good never is. It doesn't seem to matter what the problem is. The leftist anointed arrive at, the state, at a state-imposed solution, which increasingly moves the state from supporting local government to the state ruling over local government and ultimately over the individual. It wasn't for lack of trying on the part of Republicans to dissuade, improve, or at least blunt the damage of legislation being done to Coloradans. The tyranny of the masses is built into the name, founding, and history of the Democrat Party. The Democrat leadership in the House made it quite clear by unprecedented parliamentarian chicanery that dissent from their totalitarian ideology was not welcome and would be only minimally tolerated and that their agenda would move forward with the silencing of Coloradans. As the majority of Democrats, as long as Democrats have the majority, we should expect this leftward tilt to not only continue but accelerate. This is not a call to defeatism but to engagement. The values of our republic were and are the most revolutionary in history. They posit the unprecedented, that all men are created equal. These values inspired a nascent backwater of loosely affiliated colonies to challenge and defeat the greatest empire in the world. These values are our birthright of individual sovereignty, not some pottage of industrial or military preeminence. They are only values until they are traded for something we value more, however. We need to reevaluate and realign our values to rekindle the revolutionary spirit of being image bearers of a benevolent God, not serfs of a tyrannical state. Only when we realize what's at stake, will we muster the courage to defend it. Pretty powerful stuff. So with that, I'll say liberty can win. There's people fighting. The fight continues. I'm more optimistic than ever. Authoritarianism is failing. More people are waking up to what's going on. But you got to fight. 
We'll win, but only if we fight. Thank you. Nothing that I've seen. We are very thankful to our wonderful libertarian governor that now you can pay your income tax in cryptocurrency. What a wonderful establishment of freedom in Colorado. No, uh, there's nothing that I've seen. Like we've seen Texas and Florida banning these central bank digital currencies. Nothing yet that I've at least been aware of. I think it might just be Bitcoin and Doge. Just kidding. Who's next, Josh? Somebody? Hands. All right, Rodney. Uh, it's kind of a two-part question. The first question I have in front of me is, is what are three big things that we can focus our, our um, candidates on that happen in the session so that they can get over the platform so that they win the overall idea and win the extreme? That's a great point. I mean, almost not a win, but the defeat... Oh, so Ronnie was saying, what are some of the big wins? What are three big wins that our candidates, our pro-liberty candidates can celebrate as they continue running for office into the future? I don't know how many wins there were. I mean, we went over a couple of them. I think the DNA, expanding DNA testing, you know, kind of going after civil asset forfeiture, some of those things are wins. I'd say the defeat of a lot of these bad bills is probably the biggest win. The fact that Colorado is not descended to the levels of, of California or Illinois or New York on so many of these policies, I think is a huge win, you know? I'm a strong believer, people move to Colorado to be free. We come here to celebrate freedom, to start over, to live a life where we can make our own choices, you know? And that's kind of reflected in the defeat of some of these bad bills this year. Okay. Anybody else? Yes. So there's two ways to get things on the ballot. Two ways to get things on the ballot. The state legislature can refer something to the ballot. So they're going to refer this proposition HH and other ones, II or whatever, to kind of supposedly lower our property taxes. So that's one way. The other way is a citizen-led initiative. So it's very expensive because you need a lot of signatures. But if you get enough signatures from registered voters in Colorado, you can get something on the ballot for statewide approval. So one of these is led by the Independence Institute, this building we're in right now. For the last two election years, they've actually been able to get it on the ballot and pass bill, uh, propositions to lower our state income tax. Now, it's interesting to see, I mean, they, so they have a path to zero. The Independence Institute is pushing this thing path to zero to eventually eliminate the state income tax, and our governor is actually in support of that. But um, the, prop, the reductions are very small. And part of the reason they're very small is because there's this thing called the Tabor refund. So our taxpayer refunds, if the government collects too much money, constitutionally, they have to give it back to us. So the reason they're picking these numbers to decrease our taxes by 0.4% or 1.4% or something along those lines is because that's basically the refund amount. So the, they're saying, hey, it's very easy to pass. If they're going to give this money back to us anyway, why not just collect it in the first place, right? So that's kind of the strategy by, by pushing these bills. Why is there two of them? I'm not entirely sure. I'd have to look more into it. I'm, I'm sure somebody here at the Independence Institute could tell us what the uh, thought process is there, but it's wonderful. And I'd highly recommend it. You know, I'm sure there's an opportunity to be one of the people out there collecting petitions to get signatures, to get it on the ballot. And then, you know, if we can do that, that'd be huge. You can't vote. No. Oh. Yes. So on the Tabor question, <laughs> or the meeting with the professor, why is it important to pass a refund? Why is it that people get to vote on if I get time to pass a refund? Like, why are they doing so on this when they give Tabor money to other programs instead of giving it back? But it's my money, so why do I care if people get to vote or not? 
That's a great point. I, the only way they can raise taxes constitutionally is to put it to a vote of the people. So yeah, it's not necessarily fair, right? You know, it's this tyranny of the majority. You have a majority of the population say, yeah, we should steal your money and fund some sort of scheme, some sort of program that we support. Unfortunately, that's kind of one of the limitations of Tabor in a way. Natalie, do you have anything to add? For sure, for sure. All right, Tabor says how much money the government can keep and how much they have to give back. And the only way they can keep more is by putting it to the vote of the vo to the voters, right? Basically, in general terms, you know, without getting too in the weeds that I might not know. Yes. Uh, I had a question about the uh, app you were talking about earlier uh, that the legislators were using. Um, is it a custom app? Yes, yeah, the article, KUNC has actually been doing pretty good. They're more of a left-leaning news organization, but they've actually sued and done court requests to find out this information because they think they're violating state sunshine laws by doing this. They can't have secret ballots and secret votes. It has to be open to the public according to Colorado law. And it's secret almost, I mean, if they want to do 365-day legislative season. In, in a way, I guess. But, um, yeah, it's interesting. I'd love to get more background and somebody to do that research and say, who developed this app? Who are they attached to? There's a little bit about it in the article, but it's definitely part of a bigger agenda to kind of create this new type of system for legislators to operate under. And Only the Democrats are using it. Yeah, their caucus decides to do it that way. All right, who else? Any other questions? Because it wasn't real socialism. <laughs> it wasn't real rent control. They could do it better. You just need to make it a little bit stronger language, you know? You have to have more penalties to make it, hard, you know, more difficult. Anybody else? Anything? We'll check out. Yes, Natalie. I wonder if they need that refund check because it does change. Definitely, yeah. D follow freestatecolorado.com. Find me on Telegram. Sign up for my email newsletter as well. I promise I'll start doing that eventually. But I actually have an interview with Representative Ken DeGraff tomorrow. I had met, messaged him and then he's going to do an interview with me tomorrow to talk about his legislature. You're in the legislature. It's his first time there. So I want to get what, he, what surprised him. What do people need to know about how it actually operates? Because the guy who's, who writes that, I mean, he's probably got some strong beliefs and I'm sure he's going to tell it like it is. So this is from uh, Tabor here. So districts may use any reasonable method for refunds under this section, including temporary tax credits or rate reductions. Refunds need not be proportional when prior payments are impractical to identify a return. When annual district revenue is less than annual payments on general obligation, bonds, pensions, and final court judgments. So it's saying to try to
took my money and put it in a government program because my next door neighbor voted to yes. take my money and put it in a government program. I don't understand how that's legal if it's illegal. It's, de it's democracy. <laughs> It's democracy, unfortunately. My, uh, the, que the question was, for ta can they use Tabor refunds to put in some sort of other program that provides another service or fund? Yeah, and they have. That's part of what they've done, is put a ballot initiative out there and get the people to vote on it to say, let's use your tax rebate money that should come back to you and put it to some sort of socialist housing scheme or something like that. That's it. That's a good question. I'm not entirely certain on that. It doesn't seem like it seems like they probably could do that if they really wanted to. Bless you. Yeah, was, so we'll appreciate everybody for being here. Thank you very much. Love to talk to you. If you're interested in becoming a political liberty activist, please let me know. The fight is ongoing, and we are going to win.